All right. Well, so let's. Um, I want to do. I want to. I want to jump ahead to uh, as you do in your book in some ways, and 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 bring up that notion of the new world order and of where we are today, because we have all these assumptions about what our role is in the in the world. We have something I I, I don't know what the latest figure is, but somewhere between seven hundred and eight hundred bases around the world. It is extraordinary. Our military is larger than the next something like half a dozen to a dozen countries and all the big ones uh, combined uh, after that. Um, and it gets, you know, I mean, the, the, the greatest critique of that, I, we just played and that was, you know, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman going like, Hey, what, why are we doing this flyover for a half full stadium? Like that seems weird. And, and that's about it. I mean, what, what, why has this not been questioned? And, And just when I was reading, like, it's been 30 years since the fall of the wall. And I'm like, a, I'm old. And B, like, wow, there hasn't been any reckoning at all with this, except for the project for a new American century, which said the U.S. needs to be a hyperpower, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and will maintain all these low-level conflicts around the world so that no one can amass enough power to challenge us. Why hasn't there been any other sort of debate about this? Part of the reason is rooted in the 1990s. I mean, it's actually rooted in what we were just talking about, which is this inherited notion of U.S. global dominance, the idea that the only alternative to dominance is isolationism. Therefore, there's no real choice in the matter. And so when the Soviet Union completely collapsed in 1991, the immediate response of American policymakers was, we, you know, we can't go back to the supposed isolationism of like 1919. Uh, here's a great opportunity to finally fulfill our aspiration of 1945 for one world united under uh, American armed dominance. And so the Pentagon itself lays this all out in uh, something called the Defense Planning Guidance. But anyway, there's still some skepticism and talk of a peace dividend coming out. Uh, of the end of the Cold War in the 1990s. I remember Bill People, Clinton talking about that yeah. in, the, in the mid-90s, early 90s. And, and George H.W. Bush. So there's actually bipartisan agreement. We should like, you know, be investing in the United States of America. We should also be building peace around the world rather than trying to police it. There's a shift in the late 1990s when uh, PNAC and, I must say, a humanitarian interventionist uh, on the left or center-left uh, uh, ascend. Uh, there's concern about things like uh, the Rwandan genocide, uh, uh, which the U.S. didn't act against. And so also the legacy of Vietnam starts to fade. And the United States finds itself in the 1990s. It did actually um, cut its defense budget as a percentage of GDP. So it had its cake and ate it too. It entered uh, the uh, 2000s uh, in a more enviable, more dominant position uh, than ever while spending less and less. So the idea of costs, and this is also, of course, the end of history moment, the end of costs go away, even though 9-11 happens. I mean, that's a big cost, uh, kills Americans directly. And then we get into the war on terror. But there is something remarkable. We're, we're in a period of remarkable depoliticization about, uh, about America's role in the world. Certainly, that wasn't the case in the 1930s and World War II. There was a whole lot of debate and discussion and mobilization about America's role in the world. I think we are uh, at a different point, though. Uh, I think that, you know we express our foreign policy views as a country. We seem to do that in, Democrat, in a, a primary debates. Um, when there's a more meaningful discussion. This time we saw a really interesting debate on the Democratic side, such as it was, it didn't determine the outcome, but it was framed much more around who is going to end endless war than it was around standing up to, you know, the whole crew of adversaries that the United States has. That balance wasn't clear to me coming into the primary, but it's notable that uh, the more anti-war part of the party dominated that discussion. And now Democrats, Democratic voters, including centrists, say that climate change is the number one national security problem that the United States has to deal with. You know, if you take that to its logical conclusion, that's a recipe for significant change. 
Um, and even on the Republican side, things are changing. I mean, you remember Trump uh, in, in the South Carolina debate in 2016, stand yeah. up and blast the Iraq war, and he only gained strength by doing so. So I, I, I do think the, uh, the tectonic plates seem to be shifting right now, but the problem is that we're coming out of a historic period of uh, demobilization um, by the public on foreign policy issues. Um, and part and parcel of that has also been the elites um, thinking that they could just run the show, that the American people didn't care, uh, and finding that you know this is indeed not the case. All right, I, I wanna take just a quick break, and when we come back, I wanna talk about um, in the event that Joe, well, in the event that Joe Biden wins, I guess in the event that Donald Trump wins, you know, where we go from here and what are the forces that are impacting our foreign policy posture when we have such sort of depoliticization amongst our uh, society? Just a quick break and then we'll be right back uh, with more with Stephen Wertheim. 